Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Hopkins, Michigan. To those of you who are here, and more of you who are obviously out there online, almost like a Sunday after Easter. Our theme for today is Easter. It's one of the Sundays after Easter. In fact, it's the sixth Sunday, Rogate Sunday, in which we celebrate this the resurrection of our Lord. But, these, are, these Sundays after Easter are coming to an end. As of this week, we have the Ascension coming up on Thursday, which we will be celebrating next Sunday here as a gathering. So, uh, today we still celebrate Easter. That we celebrate Easter every Sunday. That's the reason why we gather here every Sunday, because of Easter. So, our theme for today is our Savior prepares us for his ascension. Uh, those, those, the readings that we have will, will reflect that thought. So as we celebrate both Easter and get prepared for the ascension that comes this Thursday, let's begin our worship with hymn number 155, Christ the Lord is risen again. We have 
come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, we need to confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. <coughs> Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. The good news is this, that God our Father has forgiven all of your sins by the perfect life and the innocent death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He has removed your sin and its guilt from you forever. The result is that you are perfect, blood-washed child of God. May God now give to each of us the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Possessing both the peace and power that forgiveness grants us, let's praise the Lord again. Men, why are you doing this? 
We too are only men like human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crop from sacrificing to them. Here ends our first lesson. Our worship continues in another portion of God's word, this time from the Psalm of the Day. Psalm of the Day is Psalm 65. You'll find it on page 89 in the front portion of Christian worship. Let's sing Psalm 65 together. <laughs> On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. 
There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Continuing at verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. I do not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory of the and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Here ends our second lesson. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Hallelujah.
sins are covered. Those are words from one of the penitential psalms of King David. Psalm 32, verse 1. The word of our God this morning, as you can see on the screen, is from the last verse of our one of our lessons this morning. Yes, we are still following the soul selections pericope, but as I told you earlier, like last Sunday, is that the soul selection pericope doesn't have a selection for today. So I had to take part of one of the lessons today for our the source of our meditation, rather than a reading from the soul selections pericope. The basis for our message this morning is from verse 27 of Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 21. These are those words. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thus far. In the name of and to the glory of the God, the triune God, who loved the world so much that he was willing to plan, send, and sacrifice his one and only Son to pay for your sins and mine, to pay for the sins of all mankind, and redeem us, your fellow believers. We began last Sunday on meditation last Sunday with the question from the TAS program in the early early evangelism history of our synod. Talk about the Savior program, as it was called. We began with that first question that is asked in that TAS program. If you were to die today, how sure would you be that you would go to heaven? I told you that when I used this TAS program, especially in my exploratory work down in, in New Mexico, I told you that many people admitted that they weren't that confident, that they weren't absolutely sure that they were going to heaven. But that is not saying that these same people did not think that they weren't going to heaven. You see, just because they were only 80% or 75% or 60% positive, they're really answering the question. They're not sure. But that wasn't saying that they did not believe that they weren't going to heaven. Because I think most people actually and it's our video legacy that gives us this temptation. Most people think that unless you are a really, 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 really super bad guy, and you have to really be super bad to be a bad guy, unless you're one of those kind of people, everybody else is going to heaven. <coughs> but news flash. Although Jesus has redeemed everyone, his redemption is universal. Everyone has been redeemed. And although the Heavenly Father has declared everyone to be not guilty of sin with an objective justification, everybody has been justified. And even though the Lord, the God of the Scriptures, wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, the truth is, not everyone wants to come to the knowledge of you. Not everyone wants to be saved. So, we still have to ask that question. If you were to die today, are you going to that you're going to heaven? We actually have to ask another question is, who is going to heaven? This morning, we heard the first part of this lesson in the scripture lessons for today. We heard from
from St. John, the experience that he was that he was given, a privilege to be able to view and get a glimpse of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. He was given a glimpse, and the Holy Spirit, as we will say later on, actually inspired him to write down that description of that holy city for posterity, for you and for me. Well, John was given even more information. Not only a glimpse of the Holy City, so that he could provide a description of it, but he also gave John the information as to who was going to be able to enter into the city and who was not. So, St. John helps us to answer the question with the words of the revelation of Jesus Christ before us this morning that tells us who will be able to enter into the holy city and, unfortunately, those who won't. Let's go back to the time of the Apostle John. This was a time when, when Christians, believers in Jesus, were not just being persecuted for their faith, they were literally being executed because of their faith in Jesus. And so when, when fellow believers saw other believers getting their heads lopped off and their heads rolling in the sand in the arena, that made some of these people think. They needed encouragement. They needed, they needed to be lifted up when it came to to continuing and being a believer in Christ. Now, some of the believers knew that that dying as a martyr was a blessing, that it meant leaving this veil of tears for their heavenly home. But many considered it to be a defeat, death, a death of a martyr. And that's the reason why, why the believers in Christ at, at John's time, towards the end of the first century, when they were being persecuted tremendously for their faith, they really needed comfort and joy to continue to be to continue being believers. And nothing gave them more joy than God's word, especially God's word that related to them the blessings that Jesus had earned for them, namely one of them being where they were going to get to go when they did breathe their last. Yes, heaven is our home. And that's no doubt why Jesus gave John the experience, the privilege to be able to get a glimpse of this so that the Holy Spirit could convince him to write that description of that, that heavenly home, that paradise down so that, so that his believers could actually be encouraged Yes, no matter what happens here, that's where we are going to get to go. Yes, no doubt. This description that John provided in the, in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ gave the believers the encouragement, lifted them up, to continue being believers no matter what they experienced in that first century after Christ. After John was inspired to write down the description of that holy city. He heard that description in the words of the lesson this morning. He continued by telling us not just what would be found there in the holy city, but he also described who would be found there. And unfortunately, verse 27 also tells us who would not be found there. In fact, we hear this from verse 27 again. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, if, if, if you are, are thinking about Holy Scripture, I think another place in Scripture would probably bring a bell. Well, that sounds like something else that I, that I read. In fact, going back to the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said something like this. Isaiah 52, verse 20, said, Put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. 
the uncircumcised and defiled or unclean will not enter you again. And Isaiah wasn't talking about the earthly city of Jerusalem. He was also talking about the heavenly, holy city, the new Jerusalem, as is the Apostle John uh, was talking about here. And again, we hear that who would be there and who would not be there. Verse 27 again, and I've changed the translation a little bit to give you an idea of the tense. And all who are defiled or unclean, that is, those who are doing, it's a present tense there, it's not just those who have done detestable acts, but those who are doing it now, presently. Those who are doing what is detestable. And those who are doing lies, or lying right now, will certainly never enter into it. Isaiah, as was John, is talking about those who would be found in the Holy City, and especially those who would not be found in the Holy City. Now Isaiah used language there that every Jew would be able to understand when he, when he said what he did in that, put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city, the uncircumcised, the Bible will not enter you again. He was using language of Old Testament Levitical law. You see, going back to the Old Testament, there were certain, certain things that people did that excluded them from being able to come into the temple and, and participate in their temple services and worship. In fact, if you weren't a Jew, uh, you were cut off from many of the things, services, and, and opportunities that, that full-blooded Jews got. And so, I think was using this kind of language to remind the the nation of Israel, that there are things that you can do that will exclude you from the presence of the just and holy God. And that is what John is talking about here. He's talking about what can and will exclude a person from being able to be in the presence and have a relationship with the just and holy God now and forever. There is, there is something that makes a person unfit. There is something that makes a person unable to be able to have a relationship with the Lord now and forever. And the Bible is very explicit, very clear about what that, that thing is that makes us unfit, unclean, and disqualifies us from having a relationship with the Lord now and forever. Bible is very clear what that is, and that is sin, isn't it? Sin separates a human being from the just and holy God. Sin is very serious. That's the reason why, why John is, is stating here what sin does. In fact, our verse states, all who are defiled and unclean, that is, those who are doing what is detestable and doing as will certainly never enter in it. Serious matter here, isn't it? John also wrote these words. More specific examples of sin that separates us from a just and holy God. But those who are cowardly and unbelieving. You know, the word cowardly, you know, if you think of all the sins that could, John could have wrote down, written down here. And he uses cowardly at the beginning, but you got to remember, this was a time of persecution. How many people became cowards? And when they had the opportunity to confess Christ or die, they chose to uh, not die and, and not confess Christ. But those who are cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and adulterers and sorcerers and idolaters and all the liars will have their lot in the lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We also hear later on in the last chapter of Revelation where John talks about the, the same kind of, of sin that separates a person from the just and holy God now and forever. He said, outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves 
and practices lying or falsehood. The Bible is very serious about sin. The Bible is very clear on what sin can do and does. And it separates you and me, human beings, from a just and holy God. However, even though every human being is sinful, every one of us is infected with sin and should be separated from our Lord forever. The Bible also provides us with a remedy for that malady of sinfulness. And that laundering process is called redemption. That process is how you and I as, as individuals take advantage of Jesus getting rid of our sin. Redemption. That's the work that Jesus came into this world to do. That's what he did as he suffered and died on the cross, spilling his life blood to pay for every single one of your sins and mine. <laughs> Scripture even talks about it as that life blood washing us clean, washing us clean of sin. In fact, Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, in, not in water, but in the blood of the Lamb, right? Wash their robes that they may go through the gates of the city. Jesus has cleansed all mankind from their sin by his work, the universal work of redemption. All mankind has been cleansed of their sin. And you and I know that the Father has decreed that what Jesus did in his work of redemption was good. And the Heavenly Father has declared all mankind to be objectively justified in that they are all not guilty of sin and 100% in a right relationship with him because of the work of Jesus' redemption. Those, those people are the people that you and I hear from Scripture at the beginning of the world, before this world was created. These are the people whom the Triune God elected or selected to be saved. And those same people, were their names were written down in a what's called the Book of Life. In fact, this is the fourth time that we hear in the Book of Revelation about the Book of Life, the Lamb's Book of Life. Names were written down prior to the creation of the world. The reason why you and I hear about election or this selection called predestination before the world began is because man's kind salvation is not based on what they would do or what they wouldn't do. And so that was based on even before they lived their life. It was based on God's mercy and grace. And that's really what that's really what election tells us is that our salvation is based on the grace and mercy of God, not on what you do or what you don't do. And so before the world began, the Lord not only elected those who would be saved, but also wrote their names down in the book of life. That's that's what uh, we hear about in verse 27. Those who will be able to enter into the holy city are those names who are written down in the book of life. But just, just so that you understand completely the, the order that this happened, I wrote this slide right here. First comes, people are elected and the names are written in the book of life before the world began. Then, in time, God sent his son and he redeemed everybody. A universal redemption. Then, when Jesus rose from the dead, he justified everyone. All mankind was justified, objectively, by Je when Jesus rose from the dead. And then in time, individually, personally, each of us are sanctified in the wide sense. You and I, I was sanctified in the wide sense when, when I was brought to faith. Uh, that wasn't by baptism, uh, but most, most people are brought or sanctified in a wide sense by when they're baptized. But when this is the case, 
This entitles a person to be able to enter into the, the holy city. You and I definitely have hardships in this world. But I think all of us would have to admit that our lives are not as hard as the people of the first century. And just think, if you and I were hauled into a court and you were told, confess Christ, or we're going to chop off your head. None of us have faced that, have we? And that's the reason why I say the hardships and the persecution of the first centuries after Jesus ascended certainly appeared to be harder times than you and I experienced this. But I'm not saying that our lives are, are simply a rose garden without thorns and prickers. You know, you and I have different trials. We have different pains, anxieties, troubles, and hurts. And you know what I'm talking about. In fact, to quote my nephew, he tells us that many days, life for us is simply a crapshoot. And that's not the words that I've used, but that's the only words that I can use. You and I, even though life has troubles and trials, we can't let those travails and trials of this life dampen our spirits, discourage us, and get us down. That's why you and I, from time to time, also need a lift. We need encouragement, just as those people did back in the first century after Jesus ascended. We need lifting up. And there's nothing better that lifts us up than the Word of our God. Especially the Gospel promises that, that we have because of what Jesus has done for us in life, death, and resurrection. And one of those blessings <laughs> is that you and I know exactly where we are going to be when we do die or breathe our last. We know exactly from the description of what we have, especially in Revelation, that it, it's a paradise, isn't it? It's going to be a wonderful place. Nothing can gladden your spirit and mind than looking forward to that. Looking forward to the fact that that's where you and I are going to be. That heaven is our home, not here. Yes. Nothing can lift up our spirit more than thinking about the place where the gate of the city is never going to be shut. Why? Because there aren't going to be any enemies to worry about anymore who can come into that gate. It's going to be open all the time, isn't it? No more enemies. And, as we heard, the whole order of things has passed away. No more sin and no more effects of sin for any of us forever. What does that mean? John tells us, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Just think, you and I get to look forward to that. One day, it's coming. And if that doesn't lift up your spirit, I don't think anything can. And Jesus has made that possible for you and for me and for everyone to go there. The Holy Spirit has brought you to faith. So you and I can thank Him as you and I are doing today. One thing that you and I need to do in the meantime, as we await for our, our Savior to, to take us to be with Him, the one thing that you and I need to remember is that you and I need to stay clean. What do I mean by that? We need to keep the status that Jesus has earned and obtained for every one of us by His work. And He worked in life and death provide you with the status of having all your sins paid for in full, completely. To keep the status that the Father has decreed about us. That we are in a right relationship with Him 100% justified. And to keep the faith that the Spirit has given to us so that we, so that we benefit from Jesus' redemption. And we benefit from the Father's justification decree. We need to stay clean. We need to keep that status. And there's nothing that can do that better than daily repentance. The 
a privilege that the Lord has given to us. The Holy Spirit comes to us with His holy law, and He makes us face recognize what we've done is sin. He makes us acknowledge that. And we can get rid of that sin by confessing it, giving it to our Savior Jesus. He can handle it, but he can't. And then he assures us that what Jesus did in, in his suffering and death on the cross has removed all of our sins, including that sin that we're confessing, that we're concerned about, or we're anxious about. He's taken that away. And it has been cleansed. Wash away, blot it out. Scripture uses a lot of terms telling us that you have been forgiven. And it's that forgiveness that gives us the power, the ability, and the motivation to want to live thankful lives to a, for our Lord and Savior after, after we recognize we've been forgiven. Yes, daily contrition and repentance assures you and me reminds you and me that our sins have been fully taken care of by our Savior Jesus so that our sins, any sin, will never ever stand in our way of you or me being able to enter into that holy city to New Jerusalem one day. Truly, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may go in through the gates into the city. May the Holy Spirit indeed grant that privilege to you and me. Amen. Let's arise and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Find it on page 40. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. May you see this for today's well. <laughs> Your righteousness for our sins, 
so that we now can stand before our God unashamed and fully accepted, clean. In your glorious resurrection, we now find the certain hope of our own resurrection. And now, O Christ, your intercession to God on our behalf today gives us courage and boldness to pray and the confidence that all of our prayers are answered by you. Should the Holy Spirit teach us all to call upon your name without ceasing? Teach us what good things to pray for. May unbelief and doubt never keep us from praying or prevent our prayers from being heard and answered. Give us faith to believe that our Lord accepts our prayers for the sake of your precious blood shed for us. Help us to pray with contrite hearts and make humble confession of our sins. Come with your divine blessings, O Holy Redeemer, and all who believe in you may in your blessings find complete satisfaction. Savior Jesus, grant that our love for you may never, ever be replaced by a lust for the things of this world. Keep us from yielding to soul-destroying sins. May the Holy Spirit keep us from trusting in anyone or anything to save us besides your merit and sacrifice, O Savior Jesus. Help us always to walk in the Spirit, and led by Him, we may follow your pure example, and thereby testify to the source of our faith and love. Forgive every occasion when we fail to trust you, to love you, to keep you in our thoughts, to serve you, to continue in your word, to pray to you, to praise you, or to witness to you about others, to others. Cover us with your righteousness, how it comforts us to know that you are our ever-living King who reigns supreme, hearing and answering all of our prayers, causing all things to work for our good. Yes, even those things that frighten and afflict us. All praise to your name on earth and heaven. We give to you, precious Jesus, Savior and Lord, in whose name we further join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May you be seated. We continue with Hymn 419, verses 5, 6, and 7. 